Hi, welcome to the Juno Files. I'm Jim Juno, and this is where we talk about Hollywood, books about Hollywood, TV, and everything else thrown in once in a while. And I have with me today uh, the author of a new book. It's on the life of Elsa Lanchester, the actress, best known for her role probably in the movie Bride of Frankenstein. The book is called Always a Bride, and I am talking with Victoria Worsley. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you for having me. Now, Always the Bride. This is the life story of Elsa Lanchester. And in the in the beginning of the book, you make it clear that, that she was always a supporting actress. Never really quite the star of the movie. That's right. And that's that was my kind of my reason for writing the book in the first place was I really wanted to shine the spotlight on her because her life, her backstory is so interesting, but it's just never been done. She's wrote about it herself, but she was always overshadowed by bigger players, her husband, her mother, um, her co-stars, everyone always seemed to shine that bit brighter at the time. And they, that's comes from the title. They're always a bride. The saying "always a bride," well, always a bride to me, never a bride. And yeah. you and you just reversed it. Always a bride. Um, we're going to talk about her most famous role in just a moment. But her early life, I mean, her mother and father—they were quite progressive for their time. Very, very progressive for their time. Yes, they. Um, her mother was a socialist. Her mother was a firebrand and an absolute personality and Elsa got a lot of her own personality from her mum um, they were socialists and Elsa's mother swore that she would never get married and this was in the late 1800s early 1900s so of course this was scandalous and her family actually um, had her committed to an insane asylum when they heard that she refused to get married um, and it was front page news um, but she stuck to her guns and she never got married. And um, uh, Biddy, which is her mum, and Seamus, Elsa's father, they were involved in all sorts of causes, vegetarianism, socialism, feminism, the suffragette movement. And she had a very unusual and quite unsettled childhood as a result of all this activism. Yeah, and she, uh, and she, uh, is that why she became, or is that why she was drawn to the stage? I think so. I mean, she loved dancing. She started dancing very early on um, with Isadora Duncan and Raymond Duncan. Well, as a child, I didn't like her because we had to, uh, she used to sit or lie on a kind of divan and was covered like a cocoon, a silk cocoon in draperies. And at that time, she had hennaed hair and painted nails. And for a child, you know, all that time ago, it was like something completely artificial and rather frightening. And she used to make us walk up in line, uh, line up in the morning and walk up and kiss her hand. And I didn't go along with that, partly, of course, because my parents were socialists and my mother was a suffragette. And the child of, of these advanced people did not like kissing hands. And um, I think it, she didn't have a lot of education and she didn't have a lot of kind of grounding in any trades or anything like that. And I think she was drawn to like the lights of London through the theater, through her dancing. She owned a nightclub when she was still a teenager. And um, a lot of theatrical and literary people came to this nightclub. And I think she got drawn into their world almost through that and through the dancing. And she, uh, she starred in a silent movie. Well, let's, let's talk, before we get to that, she was a, she was a, a stage actress first before she, she became a movie, movie actress. Yeah, well, she started off kind of doing obviously doing the dancing and doing bits on stage at this nightclub she owned and a theatre producer came to her nightclub and then cast her in various roles in his shows starting off quite small but she got a lot of press attention she was quite a personality in 1920s London um, before she ever made a film before she ever met Charles Lawton you know she was um, this darling of the bohemian literary crowd mm -hmm. And she inspired quite a few authors to to write parts in in silent films for her. Now you mentioned Charles Lofton and her husband, and they met when she was on the when she was performing on the stage. Yes, uh, they were in a play together. 
and that's how they met. And um, at the time, his star was rising very rapidly. He he started out quite late, like in his in his mid to late twenties on the stage, but his star rose very rapidly. But when they first met, they got the same pay, although his part was slightly bigger because she was more of the of a name at the time. But he overtook her very very quickly. Now and. Now, it wasn't known at the time, or maybe it was, maybe it was an open secret that he was, uh, that he was uh, homosexual. That's right. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if it was an open secret. It's very hard to tell because obviously a lot of people, they didn't talk about it. So it's hard to know who knew what. Elsa in her writings, when she does write about it, certainly says that she didn't know when they met and when they married that he preferred men. Um, and she was very shocked when she found out. Um, obviously it's hard to know how many people knew, although I think it was quite a well-kept secret because it didn't appear in the press until many, many years after he died. It wasn't one of those scandals, you know? So I assume if a lot of people had known about it, it would have been leaked a lot, <laughs> a lot sooner. But she, was she herself? Now there was a, there is an urban legend that she was also gay. Yes, I looked into it because it makes sense. We've heard of these; they called them lavender marriages, I think, yes. where both marriages are convenience for both. She certainly never admitted to it. Everything I've found seems to contradict that. In her autobiography, she seems quite shocked if women make a pass at her more than you would expect considering she was very liberal in other respects so and i just can't find any evidence of it yes not saying it never happened but there's no evidence of it now she uh she is on the stage she's a successful actress on the stage and but she appears in a silent movie called the scarlet woman i believe a maid yes, what's that have you seen it? No, I haven't. I'm going to look it up today. It's definitely <laughs> worth watching. I don't know if you can get it over there. It's available on the British Film Institute website here in the UK, but I don't know whether you guys can see that over there. But it's um, it's definitely worth watching. And tell me a little bit about that movie. Oh, well, it's by um, the author, Evelyn Waugh. Before he was a famous author, he was a uh, a bit of a rowdy lad just coming out of college, I think, and drinking a lot. And he went into Elsa's nightclub and he he fancied her. He he was trying to, to get in with her. She wasn't interested at all, but he said, he knew she was an actress. He said, would you like to be in a film that me and my friends from, from college are writing? And it's um, it's a bizarre story. It's, it's very hard to follow, but she plays this cocaine addled um, actress and but she's wonderful in silent film. She's made for silent film. She's got these wonderful reactions. This early one, it's like watching someone at the very start of their career. You can see the promise, but it's a very rough film. Um, it's amateur. It's a whole amateur job, but um, it, it's really good fun to watch. I'd recommend seeking it out. Now she uh, she appears in movies, and she's and she's doing pretty well supporting role i mean she was with she starred with her husband um in uh, the private life of henry the eighth and then also with Laurence olivier and the uh, is it called potiphar's potiphar's potiphar's, potiphar's yeah. wife okay and um so she's building her resume as we see in your book she's building it in a steady basis mm -hmm. uh, but then then in was it 1934 well, she, you know, the private life of Henry VIII, she looked beautiful in that movie. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't really aware of her, of her beauty until I saw that movie. And I was like, well, that's, that's a, I mean, she was, and she was short. She was only what, four foot 11? Um, I'm not sure. I think she was a bit taller. I think she was around five foot, but I'm not entirely uh, sure. How okay. Five foot. <laughs> well, what's an inch between friends, you know? So anyway. <laughs> But and she was was she, she was in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I didn't realize that. No, she wasn't in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. That was Maureen O'Hara. Oh, that was Maureen. Okay, okay, that's that's right. It was Maureen O'Hara. But the uh, but after 
the private life of Henry VIII a couple of years later. I get my hands out of the picture here. Uh, <laughs> she appears in uh, Bride of Frankenstein. And she's on stilts, isn't she? She is. Uh, well, when she's the bride, she appears in two roles in The Bride of Frankenstein, um, which she would not want you to forget, because that was her favourite screen role was when she played Mary Shelley in the prologue to The Bride of Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. That's when she felt she looked her best on screen. And she loved the idea of it was the director James Whale's idea that this evil, this awful evil of the, the monster, could come out of the mind of a very young, beautiful woman. I don't know why you should think so. What do you expect? Such an audience needs something stronger than a pretty little love story. So why shouldn't I write of monsters? And the idea of the devil inside. And that's why he had her playing both parts. And she loved that. But yes, when she played the bride at the end, she has stilts, she has the hair, which <laughs> everyone's aware of, the hair. And yes, she's this just incredibly glamorous. I mean, everybody knows what the Bride of Frankenstein looks like. It's lasted. It's, you know. I have no part of him. I let out a noise when I saw uh, Boris Karloff. I let out That's a noise right. like a swan. If any of you have ever seen an angry swan in the park, I don't know. It... <laughs> no, I did That's I, frightening. I, yeah, I think I did it through my nose more. <laughs> no, it's much worse. Almost uh, 90 years now, I believe. Almost, well, 85. Wow, yes, yes. And we're still talking about it. And the amazing thing in that movie, when she's the bride, she, she projects and she shows off how well of a pantomime artist she is. With with the facial the facial expressions and I mean she has no lines as the bride I think except for yeah, a scream, yeah. yeah, and and a hissing sound you know that's um, how did she I mean how did she approach that role? Well, apparently the the hissing sound the sound that she makes was um, inspired by the swans that she used to see when she went for walks in Hyde Park, and um, the swans here are not particularly friendly. <laughs> <laughs> they're, quite, they're quite terrifying and um, that was the the sound but she she did it so much and so often that by the time they wrapped she had no voice left whatsoever and um they they got on the boat and went back to England um straight after the filming of Bride of Frankenstein and she said it, she couldn't speak for the entire boat journey back <laughs> because she was <laughs> but um I don't think she ever took the Bride of Frankenstein she didn't realize what it would become it was almost horror films weren't given a lot of respect really in the 30s it's only now that we look back and see them as these these great movies that are worth saving and worth re-watching at the time the reviews would say things like bride of frankenstein is wonderful for a horror movie <laughs> you know it's like it's very good if you like that sort of thing and i, I don't think she took it as seriously, you know, she enjoyed it. She had great fun on the set. James Whale was a friend from London days. They'd been on the stage together. Um, and there was a lot of British people in the cast. So there was lots of tea breaks and she felt very at home, which she didn't always in those early days in Hollywood. She felt like a bit of an outsider. So I think she enjoyed making it. But as she got older, she was amazed that that's what she was remembered for. I tell you what, one of my favorite movie of hers and it's probably a lot of people, um, was a uh, witness for the prosecution. Yes, yes, mine too. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> tell, me a little, my... tell me a little bit about her, about how she got that role and how she approached it, you know, th therefore. Witness for the prosecution actually turned out to be her, her last on-screen appearance with her husband, Charles Lawton. Okay. And by that point in their marriage, they weren't getting on very well. They had difficult times together, but they loved working together. She said, every scene that we're in together is a love scene, even though, if, obviously, if you've seen the film, they're bickering the whole time. But I understand what she means. Underneath, there is a real affection and they work so well together that I think it's her best performance by a mile. But um, 
again, I don't think she realized how good it was at the time. She thought it was, she thought she might be a bit of a joke character in it, but then when it came out, she realized how well it all worked together. And um, of course she was nominated for an Oscar for it. That yes. was her, se her second Oscar nomination, um, although she never won. One of my other favorite, well, she was also, you know, she was also in Mary Poppins. <laughs> she was, that was Wait. the first film I ever saw her in. Is that right? Is that... <laughs> yeah. I believe you know... it when somebody told me that Katie Nana and the Bride of Frankenstein were the same person. When I was little, I was like, no, because <laughs> Katie was old and grumpy and the bride was so glamorous, but she had a real range. And one of my one of my other favorite roles were for her, <laughs> excuse me, were um, later later in her career, Murder by Death. Yes, um, and, she's almost Miss Marple like, isn't she? Yes, she's uh, she's like the she's the uh, she's the Miss Marple one, and then uh, is it Estelle Winwood? Yeah. I believe believe it's her. <laughs> she's the uh, she's the nurse confined to the wheelchair, you know. <laughs> so, but um, you know, she seemed to have fun wherever she, whatever movie she was in. It, you could see she was having fun with those kind of characters. Yeah, I feel like she always used to say that that Charles Lawton was the one who took these things seriously. He was quite early method acting, you know, so he really researched everything and lived his parts. Whereas she saw it as she loved it. She used to go in and enjoy herself and she didn't take it seriously. Um, towards the end of her career, she did say that she didn't particularly enjoy it anymore, the long hours and everything. I think she would always have loved to return to the stage. I think that's where she, she really enjoyed being. Um, but yeah, she always seemed to be having a good time and she, she gives some great performances. I think she's best in comedy for me. I like her as a comedian, but a little bit light, a little bit lighthearted roles that she did. Yes, yeah. Well, although she did strident very well when, mm -hmm. like Katie Nana in in Mary Poppins, when she had to be uh, bossy and shrill, she did that very well as well. Let's talk a little bit about about you and how did you get drawn to Elsa Lanchester? Well, I looked up. I looked her up um, after watching Witness for the Prosecution because I did that thing years and years ago where you think, where do I know her from? I know her from somewhere. So I looked her up and as I was reading about her, I was like, wow, I've got to read a book. Her, her life is fascinating. So I read her autobiography, but it was all about Charles Lawton. It had, I had a bit about her and her childhood and that was great. But then the rest of it, once she met her husband, it was all about his career because her life had revolved so much around him, but I wanted to know about her career. So I realized if I wanted to read about that, I'd, I was gonna have to write it because there wasn't a book out there that, that told her story. Um, and that seemed to be reflected in a lot of the reviews of her autobiography. Everyone was saying, this is brilliant, but I don't want to know about her husband. He's almost fallen out of favor a bit. People aren't looking for information about him. They're looking for information about her, but for me, it was her childhood and her kind of growing up in the 20s, the idea that she owned a nightclub and did all of this stuff before being eclipsed essentially by a more famous husband. And then going to Hollywood where they'd never seemed to quite know what to do with her. She was a bit too pretty to be plain. She was too plain to be a lead. <laughs> and they never seemed to quite know where where to put it, they'd try her in a musical and then they'd go, mm, no, they'd try her in a horror film. They'd make her the best friend. They never seemed to quite know where to fit. But throughout her film career, she had a, a stage show in Hollywood where mm -hmm. she did, you know, song and dance routines and she loved it. And I thought that's just a really interesting story. I was fascinated by her from, from that point onwards. And then fortunately, when we went into lockdown, it gave me the opportunity to, to gather all the notes together. Hey, something did good, good come out of the pandemic. All right, let's see. <laughs> now, but it, you know, there was there, how big of a challenge was that? Because let's, let's face it, she performed and she was living, there was no internet when she was around. Um, a lot of, was a lot of the uh, information, I guess, you know, you had to recover because it was World War II probably, probably, destroyed a lot of the records so how, how big of a challenge was that uh, fortunately um 
there's some wonderful archives um, in this country that, that, I was, that I was able to access with papers, letters. I've been privileged to read a lot of letters. Letters are the best source for the past because if those people aren't with us anymore, that's, it's, there's something incredible about reading the personal letters that they wrote when they were out on the road touring with these shows, the letters they wrote home. Um, lots of newspaper articles, but as you say, it's she lived a long time ago and, and everything's changed a lot. And the way things were viewed then, the way things were reported on has changed. We're less interested in certain things and we want to know more personal details, but hopefully I've managed to get enough so that the story, the narrative works through. Oh, well, fantastic. And do you have any, any projects coming down the pipe, as we say in America? I don't at the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a bit, I'm a bit writing out at the moment. I, I've got so many ideas, but at the moment, I just want to enjoy talking about Elsa and, and hearing other people, <laughs> what other people say about her. Exactly, yeah. Well, Victoria, it's been great talking to you. Uh, the book is all, uh, Elsa Lanchester, Always the Bride. It's out now. Yes. It, it, it was going to be out earlier, but it got a little bit delayed, didn't it? That's right, yes. So, but it's available now, Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk. Um, and if you want to go into your brick and mortar store and have, if they don't have it, have them order it. Again, Victoria Worsley, thanks again for being on the Juno Files today. Thank you ever so much for having me.